There's a holdup in the Bronx, Brooklyn's broken out in fights. There's a traffic jam in Harlem that's backed up to Jackson Heights. There's a scout troop short a child, cruise ships to an idle wild. Car 54, where are you? All right, guys, you guys are in for a real treat this afternoon. Uh, I've had the honor of having so many wonderful actors from Hollywood's golden age as guests on my podcast. My guest this afternoon, actor Hank Garrett, definitely fits that role. As a youth growing up on the mean streets of Harlem, he roamed the streets as a hoodlum and constantly found himself in trouble with the law. He eventually turned his life around and has gone on to inspire many of today's wayward youths down to the path of a life of fulfillment. Along the way, as an actor, he has appeared in episodes of Columbo, Kojak, BJ and the Bear, Paris, Three's Company, as well as playing Officer Nicholson, Car 54, Where Are You? But to many, he may best be known for playing the gritty role as the killer mailman alongside Robert Redford and Faye Dunaway in Sidney Pollock's 1975 thriller, Three Days of the Condor. He's back again on the show to talk about his new book in his life called From Harlem Hoodlum to Hollywood Heavyweight. Actor, voiceover artist, and martial artist, Hall of Famer, the great Hank Garrett. Hank, thank you so much for your time this afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> That's the I show for today. Who are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> Whew, that was a long intro. Ooh, I think I was going to make it, to be honest with you, Hank. <laughs> <laughs> I, I want to start off by, first of all, thank you so much for your time. And, um, you. I, you know, I, I got to ask you, I mean, like I said in the intro, you you know you grew up in a rough neighborhood, a rough rough childhood. I mean, obviously your career, you've gone through, you've been with Robert Redfords of the world, all these big stars. I mean, when you're doing interv- interviews on a studio at a radio station, and they say Hollywood icon or Hollywood legend joins me, I mean, do you do you turn around and say who? Where is he? Yeah, you know? exactly. I I would say somebody said. Oh, do you know that you were a legend? I said, oh, I thought they were saying a leg end. <laughs> what do I know? <laughs> yeah, I, uh, I, I started off, uh, well, my, pet, my folks were immigrants from Russia, and uh, I was born very late in life to them, and they were fruit and vegetable peddlers. Uh, they had a push gun on the streets. And... Uh, guy that was my mom's customer uh, she were, he was the mayor of Harlem and my mother was crying to him that I was always in trouble. I actually slept in cardboard boxes on the street wow. because my mother and father didn't even know whether I was home or not Jeez. and this, this gentleman said uh, your mother has asked me to take you out and I thought my mother wants me knocked off <laughs> that was a term back then. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so he says, no, 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 no I'm, I'm taking you out. To, first first thing he did, he walked up to me and, and slapped the cigarette out of my mouth. Wow. I'm, I was 12 years old. And he said, you have a suit? I said, yeah, I got a suit. He says, I want you to wear the suit. But before you put the suit on, take a bath. I went to throw a shot at him right then and there. And I saw two mountains came toward me. They were his bodyguards. Anyway, he, I, I went with him that evening, and he took me to the Apollo Theater. Wow. And I see, and I looked at the marquee, and it said Sammy Davis Jr. Now, I heard the name, didn't know too much about him. You know, I'm, I'm on the street. What do I know about anything? He took me up to the dressing room to meet Sammy Davis Jr. Sammy said, sit down, man. I sat there, and he said, the mayor said, you're a pretty tough kid. So, either going to wind up with scars or broken bones. But the way you're going, you're either going to go to prison or you're going to die. I'm 12. But I had a gun in my pocket. I had a twenty five caliber pistol wow. that one of the older mob guys had given me. 
And I and I thought about this and I went, wow, this is it. I said, this, this was, he said, the way you're going, that's it. He got me a job as a band boy with an all African American band. I said, what is it? What's a band boy? He said, you put the charts out for the musicians and at the end of the gig, get everything together in a proper books and put it in this case. I did, there was a, a show at the Teresa Hotel. And he came up to me after the gig and said, you did a good job, my man, here. And he gave me 50 bucks. Holy crap, that's like $1,000. Yes, exactly, I said, $50. He says, get yourself some new kicks. My shoes were torn to shreds. <laughs> Next day, I went to Floorsheim Shoes and I bought a pair of Four shine for fifteen dollars gave my mother the thirty five more money than she had seen in her lifetime. Wow, amazing! Now, it, oh yeah, it was incredible. Because you know, you know, Hank, you like you say, you grew up really dirt poor, and uh, you know, as a kid, you had a lot of pets, but unfortunately, they were roaches, mice, and rats. Oh, <laughs> I got to tell you, when I walked into the kitchen, if you put the light on. The wall moved. It was all roaches. Oh my goodness! Wow. One night, one night, I woke up when I was home sleeping. I felt this this heaviness on my chest. So I reach up for the cord <laughs> that was the light cord. I put that on, and there's a rat sitting on my chest. Uh, oh my goodness! Wow! And I swat the thing. It and it fell on the floor, and it glared at me. That rat was bigger than my cat. Wow. wow. So I'm saying, you know, well, I thank God for Sammy Davis Jr. Now, honest to God, God sent me an angel. It's Both, interesting. I'm, two, hey. 20 some odd years later, on Tony Bennett's opening act, we were at the Sands opening night. I'm going on first. I walk out Ringside, Frank Sinatra, Dean Martin, Peter Lawford, and Sammy Davis Jr. Wow. I finish I finish my, my show. Frank gives me a standing ovation. Now, when Frank stands up, the world stands up. Amen. And, yes, exactly. We finish the show. Sammy Davis Jr. walks up to me and says, You're a funny cat. Where do I know you from? I said, Sam, I'm the kid you said was going to go to prison or die. And he said, that's you? And we started to cry. Man, I'm, I'm starting to well up right now. Wow. Amazing. And uh, next day, I was Tony Bennett's opening act for four years after being a street hoodlum. Right, not right. knowing when I was going to get my next bit of food. You, you know, it's, it, life is very, it's incredibly funny sometimes. You know, like you say, your background, that's why you wrote the book. I mean, for my audience out there, I mean, just go get this book. It's called From Harlem Hoodlum to Hollywood Heavyweight. And Hank talks a lot about his upbringing in, you know, his childhood. And, you know, like you say, Sammy Davis Jr. was like an, a, an angel sent to you in you know, life come, becomes full circle is my point. You, later on, years later, you went on to appear uh, at the Apollo. Yes, I was the first white comedian to appear at the Apollo Theater. Thanks to crazy? A, a, another wonderful, wonderful comedian. Uh, he, he was on Car 54. And he was also a stand-up comic, African-American. And his name was Nipsey Russell. Yes, yes. And Nipsey got me into the Apollo, and when I walked out on stage, my whole neighborhood was there. Oh. All the wise guys I grew up with. Were they looking for money? A lot, a lot of Puerto Rican families. <laughs> all the guys, the African-American guys were there. And, oh, oh I, I got to tell you, I, the, the warden of a prison came to me when I was at the Copacabana and he said, Mr. Garrett, 
would it be possible for you to come and do a show for the men? Let them know they're not forgotten. I said, yeah, oh, okay. Well, next day, here I am. I didn't, I didn't wear the tux, but I had a nice suit on. And Warden introduced me. Gentlemen, he says, here's a man who is from New York. And he's here, and he's appearing at the Copacabana. And he's here to talk to you, to entertain you. I walk out on stage and I hear, Hey, Hank, how you doing, baby? <laughs> All the guys I grew up with are sitting there. <laughs> and wow. one of the guys yelled, Hey, give him a number. He belongs here with us. Wow. Was that Lefty? Was Lefty there with you? <laughs> no, he wasn't. But I've got to tell you, I look at the warden and I see all the color drain out of his face. <laughs> Copacabana, oh. that was that was Mobster Frank Costello's joint. Did you ever meet Frank Costello? Oh, yes. And what was he that? He was like? he was behind the Copa. He right, right. he owned the Copa. Correct, correct. Yes. Oh wow. yeah. Wow. Wow. So, so Frank, let, let's circle back. So, so how do you, how does it, how do you get the role of Office and Nicholson? Because you're not a classically trained actor. You didn't go to um, Lee Strasberg's School of Acting with all Paul Newman, all these giants of the world. Captain Block. Yes. This is my yesterday's report, sir. Sir, about my partner Schnauzer. Yes. I think he needs a little vacation or something. His mind is getting a little foggy. Go on, go on. Well, I started this morning. He came up to me and asked me what day it what was. What did you hand me? This report is for Wednesday. Where's yesterday's report? Yesterday's? Yesterday was Wednesday. What's the matter with you? Yesterday was Thursday. Today is Friday. Today is Friday? Friday. Look, Nicholson, if you'd stop worrying about Schnauzer's state of mind and start worrying about your own, maybe you know what day this is. That's all. Yes, <laughs> Precinct is falling apart. How does Hank Garrett get the role of Officer Nicholson on Car 54, Where Are You? Well, I was a cop for about a minute and a half because <laughs> I thought I was going to make a difference in people's lives. As a cop who is different than the guy who come over and slap you across the face. I had that. And so a friend of mine who was a fellow comic, his wife was working for Matt Hyken, who created several, the Bilko Show. Yes, correct. The Martha Phil Ray Silver. Show. And I was working on Car 54. I got to, he gets me, my, he was, he get me in this audition. I walk in, sit down. Matt Hyken is sitting there, the, the genius. And he looks at me and he points to me and says, you're Ed Nicholson. And I said, oh, no, 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 I'm Hank Garrett. He says, just the kind of dummy I'm looking for. <laughs> Nicholson is the character you're going to play. On you're perfect, show. kid. You're perfect. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> oh, that's beautiful. Uh, you, know, you know, you mentioned the Phil Silver's show, you know, Car 54, where are you, Mata Ray? What do you think, what was it about Nat Hiken that made him so brilliant? Uh, he, he was the most unnoticed a gentleman, uh, he was kind of very, uh, not standoffish, but very shy. He'd smoke a cigarette, and while he was smoking, he was creating. He created all these shows. Brilliant, right? And, yeah, yeah. and it was amazing. Brilliant. Uh, uh, so he, he was also shrewd as well, because he found that you were, and we'll get into it, but you were also a wrestler as well. So he tells you, yes. listen, listen, Hank, no wrestling. You just got to do this show, and that's it. <laughs> well, they, I, I had to sign a contract, right? That I couldn't that I couldn't wrestle while I was doing the show because if I got hurt, it would hold back production, and it, you know, talking about hundreds of thousands of dollars. But I did anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I wrestled uh, at the Hollywood Legion Stadium. Wow. And all, all the celebrities were there. I had no idea. Oh, they were all there to watch either the fights or the wrestling matches. 
and I was wrestling a guy who, uh, oh my God, Snooky, a Billy Snooker, uh, and wow. And I look and I see all these celebrity city men. I say, I'm dead. Matt Hikins <laughs> finds out about it. He's going to just You're bounce a dead me man. off You're the a dead man. You're a dead man. Oh, absolutely. And I, I come in the next morning. Uh, we had to be there at 5.30 in, in the morning in the Bronx. So I go and uh, <laughs> one of the, the assistant production guys says, Matt wants to talk to you. Uh-oh. And I went, oh, God. I walk in, Matt says, uh, uh, you know, you signed a contract. You're not supposed to wrestle if you get hurt. I said, Matt, uh, I'm so terribly sorry. He says, you shouldn't be sorry. You were damn good. I was in the audience. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> tell, tell my audience what you, you, what the name you wrestled under. Hank Daniels, the Minnesota farm boy. I'd never been to Minnesota. I had never seen a farm. <laughs> when, I first, when I first came out to California, I, I had a series. I was co-starring with James Earl Jones in the series. It was short-lived, but God, it was, it was wonderful. And I learned so much about acting with James Earl Jones. So now I got a line. I'm from New York. My line is, okay, I'll come around. I'm going to go get the car. Cut. I said, what did I say wrong? And they said, Hank, there's an R in car. I said, there is? Where? Not where I, not where I come from. <laughs> <laughs> they said, where are you from? I said, guess. They said, what part of New York are you from? I'm from Harlem. And then he'd start throwing names at me. The guys I grew up with, all the wise guys. Wow. Oh, my God. Wow. But this was the kind of life. And because of the, that kind of life, I hadn't thanked God for sending me this angel. Deanna Marie, my manager, set it up where I go to prisons and I talk to the kids. I'm talking about babies, 11 to 17, that are in prison. And I go, she, she will have them play one of the Car 54 uh, videos. And now the kids are looking and they, they've never seen Car 54. And I, and I walk out, and they were laughing at the show, and I walk out and I tell them, you see where you're sitting? I was there, just where you're sitting. I was there. Oh. And they looked at me like, what? And I tell them that God sent me an angel and there's an angel waiting for each and every one of you. But you've got to be ready to listen to the angel with your ears and your heart. Do, do you ever I, get any... Honestly, did- God, I got 14 letters from these kids saying, Sammy Davis Jr. was your angel. Mr. Garrett, you're our angel. Wow. It just that's absolutely beautiful. killed me. Beautiful. That's beautiful. That, you know, and that's what it's all about. It's all Everything comes full circle, you know? Yeah. Yes. You, you turn into the angel. It's funny. God has a oh. plan for everybody, but the, the Lord, he sure does work in mysterious ways. I well, give him that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. He's much. got an incredible sense of humor. <laughs> um, speaking of Car 54, uh, Hank, uh, you know, we talked about the brilliant mind of the great Hank. Uh, Hank, you too as well. Nat Hiken. <laughs> Nat Hiken, the great Nat Hiken. Uh, why do you think Nat Hiken was attracted to so many slobs like Joey Ross and Maurice Gosfield? I don't know. <laughs> Honestly, and, in fact, we were all kind of staring at <laughs> We, you know, when we got our uniforms, all tailor-made uniforms, oh, we looked great. And there was a, 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 a little restaurant in the studio. So now we're sitting and eating. And when you got through eating, you walk over and you tell them what you ate. 
and you pay accordingly. You know, I had a, a chef salad until a dollar seventy five. Okay, Joey would come over to the <laughs> to the cashier, and he'd have to say a word. They say, oh, I see, uh uh-huh, you had the potato salad because it was all over his coats. (laughs) And you had the chicken noodle soup, I can see it on your shoes. And (laughs) next day, Matt Hyken comes into the the cafeteria and covered Joey with a bed sheet. (laughs) Now you can eat. Go. (laughs) Mind you, baby. (laughs) Mind you, mind you, Grisha. (laughs) Uh, Uh, Stop on. Yes, not born. He, he was a crazy guy, Joey Joey Ross. Um, oh yeah, I, I believe he was married oh, to like yeah. eight. I could be wrong. Seven or eight hookers. Um, very very dirty comic. For back then, it was a very it was a very dirty comic. Him and yes, other, exactly, exactly. Uh, so so like Joey Ross and yourself, you had a hard time memorizing lines. Is that true? Oh, he couldn't remember his name. <laughs> Is that tell, tell my audience about the, how we came up with that famous shtick? Well, that ooh ooh, yeah, ooh that's ooh, because he he couldn't remember the lines. He was stalling. He was stalling. Exactly, hoping it would come to him, <laughs> and it worked. It worked. Oh, I know. <laughs> uh, also on that show, uh, Hank was the great Al Lewis from uh, remembers Al Lewis. From Grandpa and he, the Monsters, he was also in Car Fifty Four. Where are you? He uh, played uh, my partner. Right. So, so Hank, I got to ask you: What percentage would you say were, uh, the stories that Al Lewis told you were true? What percentage? Uh, well, he had an incredible imagination. <laughs> and we won't go any further. Than that. <laughs> uh, how was it work with Al Lewis? Uh, by the way, it, we were. F- at each other all the time, and it worked on screen as well. We were uh, always arguing about something or other. Really? Wow, that's oh. funny. Uh, I, I got to ask you about Fred Gwynn. Uh, there was, I mean, oh. that's from what I've read, obviously you were there. Um, he worked, obviously, he worked side by side with Joey Ross. That was his partner on the show. Uh, he was a classically trained actor, from what I, from what I've read. Well, and, he it, it, graduated Yale. Right. Uh, he was an incredible cartoonist, and he wrote children's books and illustrated them as well. He was a wonderful guy, a very kind of uh, laid back human being, uh, and he was wonderful to be with. He was never over assuming anything, he was never trying to top you. Uh, and working with Joey, oh my God, you had to have the patience of 12 saints. Because <laughs> yeah, he used to smash his head into the lockers. Oh. <laughs> wow. Uh, so you uh, terrific uh, guy. Uh, I want to ask you this real quick, Hank. Um, so I, I know you, 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 Sid Caesar was like a mentor or a friend to you, but tell me if this is true. As a kid, uh, your show of shows, did you sneak in to watch that? Yes. Wow. Wow. I went, climbed the fire escape on the back of the theater and went over the roof into the theater where they were rehearsing. And I was sitting up on the top and I laughed out loud. The sketch with uh, Sid Caesar was brilliant and the guys who worked with him were brilliant. And they stopped and Sid heard me and said, who's up there? Wow. And I stood up and uh, people came running toward me. He said, hey, you, come on down here. And I came down and he said, what are you doing here? And I said, I'm, I'm a big fan of yours, Mr. Caesar. He said, sit here, right here, right, right off the stage, right here. And I sat there. And he just looked at me and said, you do not laugh at anybody else's stuff but mine. Wow. (laughs) I said, okay. And we we developed a friendship. Because of him, I learned to do dialectic gibberish. And I I became his, his pupil. 
And one day I'm at the Copa and a guy came over to me and he was a British actor. And he said, you do such beautiful dialect. He said, would you be interested in going to London to do a show? I said, what? He said, because of the dialect you're doing, they're looking for someone who can be a different character each week doing different dialects. You, and he, they were going to dress me accordingly. So I, I, God, yes. Next thing I know, I get a call from London and making me an offer. I turn it over to my manager when I was with the William Morris at the time. And they work out a deal. I'm on my way to London to do that was the week that was with David Frost. Wow. Wow. Amazing. Now, David and I became friends. In fact, every weekend he would take the cast and we would go to Paris. And we would spend the weekend in Paris. And he was paid, picking up all the tabs. Hmm. And one time he said to me, Hank, do me a favor. He said, you're going to be a Chinese delivery man. I want you to go nuts. I said, really? He said, oh, yeah. Come in. I'm bringing the X I'm made up to look like an, 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 an Oriental. And he says, uh, yes, can I help you? <laughs> I ran into the audience screaming, oh, they, he said, okay, hang cut. Because as it, I ran into the hall of the theater, I was still screaming. In with the Chinese dialect. Well, so was, I know you, uh, uh, what a time. I'm going to I'm going to tell you I'm a, I'm a first generation Italian American Hank. Do you have an Italian one in your in your arsenal? Sounds like my old man. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, God. Uh, Hank, I, I, I want to talk to you about a movie. In 1979, you make a movie called Firepower. This is a great story. Uh, with O.J. Simpson and, and somebody else. Can you tell my audience that story? Oh, my God. Sophia Loren. Oh, mamma mia. You would. Uh, um, uh, Beautiful. Scusate. I just, went, I just had a, a memory. Well... <laughs> I'm a, a bad guy, uh, and we're in the British West Indies. It's where we shot the film. O.J. Simpson, uh, Sophia is my boss's girlfriend, and she's in a gift shop. And I walk in, and I said, look, Oscar wants to see you now. And she says, you tell Oscar to wait. I look at her and I said, nobody tells Oscar to wait. And I wipe everything off this table, all gifts and crashing. And, and I grab her arm and I yank her arm and I'm yanking her out of the gift shop. And I throw her into a car. OJ is supposed to rescue her. And how he's supposed to rescue, as I'm standing there, I put her in the driver's seat and I'm standing there and he's supposed to run behind me, grab him at the back of my head, bang it against the car. I go down, he grabs her, and they take off. The door is open. OJ grabs my hair, slams my head against the edge of the door, cuts me wide open. Oh. Down I go. Cut, cut, cut. Somebody runs to get my then wife, she's at the hotel, which is right on location. She comes running out. I am lying in Sophia's lap. Oh, she's got a towel. 
<laughs> she's got to tell her she's bo- she's blotting the blood and saying, my poor baby, my poor baby. My wife looks at me, and my wife looks at me lying in Sophia's lap, and she says, are you comfortable? I said, well, yeah, I make a nice living. <laughs> Oh, that's beautiful. She, she ran back to the hotel and packed and left. She caught the first plane back to New York. Well, we finish the movie. I go back home. We kind of reconcile. So one evening, we're out. We're going out to dinner. We're walking. And this is an evening. And I'd like in 72nd or 73rd Street, there's a small private hotel. We're across the street from the entrance of the hotel, and I see two guys in suits stepping out, and they're looking across the street, up down the street, up the street. I said, ah, bodyguards. I come Sophia. And she sees me standing across the street with my (laughs) then wife. She runs across the street, throws her arms around me, and says, hi, baby, how's your head? And I hear... In the distance, I hear, taxi, taxi. <laughs> that was the end of her. <laughs> I got the papers for the divorce about a week later. At least you had a good excuse. Why'd you get divorced? I, I had Sophia Loren. All, she was always hanging on me. Exactly. You know I mean? <laughs> even the lawyer, the judge, even the judge. Hey, what do you want from the guy? Oh. Give him a break. Let him oh, go. What do you want? Even the judge will give you a light, light sentence. <laughs> no, the, the judge would have said, put this guy in a straitjacket. He's just nuts. <laughs> oh, that's a beautiful story. And just for the record, in that, that movie also starred James Colburn, Eli Wallach, and Anthony Francioza as well. Yes. Yes. And, and James Colburn and I became good, good friends. He used to call me Minnesota. <laughs> oh, he was a wrestling fan, and oh, uh, I loved him. I loved and missed him. Hey, tell me if this is true, Hank. That, that OJ actually, after that movie came out, he went around telling people, you know, because you're a big martial artist, you know, you're a bodybuilder, yeah. you're a big. He went around telling people that he actually knocked out the great Hank Garrett. Yeah, he he said, "Oh man, he was he was a cent should take out." Wow. And meanwhile, he kept apologizing to me. Oh, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Are you okay? Yeah. yeah well, uh, well did, I, did, in ahead. my stupidity, I went looking for him. I'm serious. Wow. Did you ever find him? Uh, no. No, no, hmm. no. Because I was going to just, uh, well, I won't even yeah, right. this. Yeah, right. Yeah, well. <laughs> you probably should have because it's a lot. Yeah, you probably should have because yeah. some other people. Yeah. Anyways, um, yeah. Uh, let's talk about uh, you played the killer mailman in the 1975 Sidney Pollack thriller Three Days of the Condor. I mean, how does Hank Gary become the killer mailman? I went up for the audition and I saw Sidney, who was a fantastic guy. Brilliant comic, not com- the comic, a brilliant director. And when I went in to meet him, he looked at me and said, what do you know about martial arts? I said, well, I'm a grandmaster. He said, you're a grandmaster martial arts? He said, oh, uh, okay. I want you to find out when we need you, and I want you to go get uh, dressed into uh, a suit. Uh, as a mailman and that was it hmm. I said do you want me to read he said no you got the part you got wow. the look that was it oh, wow wow that was it oh uh, wow that was it and, and <laughs> in the fight scene just before the fight scene uh I had just killed everybody in the, the office machine gun them I was oh it was a frightening scene to, to, to really experience it. And so I, I go and I, I'm the fight scene with, with uh, Robert. He takes a pot of coffee and he throws it and it's supposed to hit me in the face. But and he wasn't even in the shot. It was a tight close up of my face. 
and Redford comes out of his dressing room and he looks and he sees the pot of coffee and there's smoke coming out of the pot of coffee. So he says to the guy who's handling special effects, he says, what's in there? He says, that's hot coffee. He said, no, 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 no. He says, it's some kind of acid diluted with mineral oil. And Redford says, acid? Whoa, whoa, wait a minute. He says, what if we get, he's going to get burnt. He said, no, no, the guy sticks his finger in. So see, it doesn't burn. And Redford said, what if it goes into your eye? And everybody stopped dead. He walked over to Sidney Pollack and said, Sid, let me throw the coffee. And he said, he called me over and said, Hank, I'm going to hit you waist high with the coffee and you're to lift your hands up to your face as though I hit you in the face. Well, they, we do the fight and he threw the fight the coffee and we continued the fight. It turns out to be, I get the New York Film Critics Award for best fight scene. And later on, about a few years later, we're in Vegas. We're, we're taken to Vegas and I receive a special award for best fight scene in film ever. Wow. Wow. And uh, it was just an amazing, amazing moment. Because, hey, during that fight scene, you actually broke broke something of Robert as well. Yes. I, how, well, how do I repay him for saving my eyesight? I break his nose. <laughs> That'll teach him to mind his own business. That's right. That'll teach him to mind his own business with the coffee. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> talk about um, these. Talk about your brown Adidas sneakers, if you can, because they played a pivotal role. Yes, those were his. Wow. That was Redford shoes because they said, how do we know that Hank is not a real mailman? And Redford went into his dressing room, came out with the brown Adidas shoes and says, put these on. He checked with Sydney, and he said, oh my God, that's perfect. Because there's a scene where he walks away and in his mind's eye, you see him looking at my feet and sees the brown Adidas and he knows that I'm not a real mailman. Mm. Right, because you have to have government shoes. I know from experience. You have to have the government <laughs> shoes. That, <laughs> to match yeah. the pen. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's true. That's a true story. Yeah. Um, if you fall down a flight of stairs as a mailman, you got a pair of Adidas on, and you want to sue somebody, they say, well, you got the wrong footwear on. That's <laughs> exactly. true story. That's true. <laughs> um, hey, real quick, Hank, you had a, a very famous wrestling partner when you were wrestling. Oh, my God. Well, I, I wrestled Gene, well, Gene LaBelle was my mentor, Judo Gene LaBelle. And he was, oh, it had 300 worldwide Judo matches and did not lose any. He won every one of them. He was my mentor. And, oh, God. And one of the first guys I wrestled was Killer Kowalski. Killer Kowalski, yeah, he's a local guy here in Boston. Oh, yeah. he, and you know, he was huge. Huge. But the, the nicest guy in the world until he got in the ring. <laughs> then he was going to remove your spinal column. <laughs> uh, let Lenny uh, Montana as well. Oh, Lenny. Lenny Montana. God uh, rest him. Oh, my God, was he a sweetie. For my audience out there do not know the name, that was Luca Brazzi from The Godfather. Godfather, exactly. Guts the ice pick to his hand. Wow, amazing. Uh, Hank, talk about some of your voiceover work real quick. Uh, yeah, I, I did the voice of uh, on G.I. Joe. Uh, oh, boy. Uh, God, I did voices on Garfield. I did Fluffy and Fast Eddie on Garfield, wow. and the two of them having a conversation where I had to keep switching from one voice to the other without losing continuity. Oh. That was fun. Uh, yeah, I, I've done a bunch of stuff. Did your, did your dear friend and national treasure, Jimmy Weldon, did he give you any tip, tips? Oh, my God. I was with Jimmy the other night. Oh, yeah? Uh, 
Yes, in fact, uh, they ran a show that we did together, uh, and they ran it because of the Veterans Day. And Jimmy is 97 years old now. Uh, God bless him. God love him. And he's one and of the... He, he, go ahead. He was there to at the opening or the liberation of Buchenwald. Wow. In the Second World War. The concentration yeah. camp, right. Uh, wow. Yeah, he, uh, yeah, he's amazing. He's like the only guy left ever back then who did all those voices from Hanna-Barbera. Yes. Amazing. Yeah, uh, I'm the only one left on Car 54. Yes, yes. Wow. Amazing. Yeah, we did Charlotte Ray. I had her on a while ago. We just yes. lost her. She was oh, great. God bless us. Uh, Alice Ghostly. We had so much fun with her. Alice Ghostly, yeah, all the greats, including yourself. Uh, so uh, I got to ask you, I got to ask you, Hank, and I hate to be a cliche question because I like to hit my guests with some kind of different angles, you know. But, you know, why the book? Talk about the book real, if you can. Uh, had it not been for Deanna Marie, my manager, there would not be a book. The Red she Warrior, the would, Red Warrior. I would be telling her stories about, well, you know, my, my past life. And she'd say, how could you have done all these different things in this short a time? And we sat and wrote. She took notes on everything I said because I was wrestling pro when I was in high school. I, and yet I had to get a license to wrestle pro. But they had a lie about my age. They made me 10 years older hmm. in order to get the, the, the license. I was wrestling pro when I was 17 years old. I started wrestling uh, amateur at 16. I turned pro at 17, but they said, you have to have a license. So I, I was doing that. And High school, I decided to take the test for the police department. I did the dumbest things in the world. If I ever got caught, I would really, really been in a lot of serious, serious trouble. But I took a shot anyway. And uh, thank God that God is good. <laughs> Amen. And uh, Amen. here I am. Oh, amazing. It, 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 it's a phenomenal book. It's called From... From Harlem Hoodlum to Hollywood Heavyweight details the, the amazing life of uh, the great Hank Garrett. Hank, uh, where can they get the book and wh where can they get the copy of the book? They'll be at Amazon and uh, there'll be a number of other, other booksellers and the book release is on the 15th of this month. Oh, wow. Yeah, coming, right, coming up pretty soon. And uh, I know it's going to be a hit for you because, I mean, Thank again... You. And like I said before we even started the interview, that you're one of the good guys. You're one of the nice guys. You're, you're like that conduit to Hollywood's golden age when, you know, there was stardom and glamour and glitz. Today it's just crap and crap and I could say something yeah, else. Yeah, I know. Yeah, it's I know. not really. What do you miss about Hollywood's golden age, Hank? What do you miss about I those had, days? I had the very good fortune of working with a, a number of the major, major stars, you know, like Sophia. You work with Al Pacino, and, uh, Al Pacino and Serpico, too. Yeah, oh, yeah. Uh, oh, Al. Al said, because I've always been a bodybuilder. And I, in fact, I was a competition powerlifter. I, at one point, I broke the New York State powerlifting record. So now I, I'm working with Al. I'm playing Muscles Malone, a nasty detective. And Al said to me, where do you work out? And I said, oh, it's a local gym. Why don't you come down now? Hmm. Well, Al, I'm working. I'm at the gym. I'm working out. Here's Al standing in the corner. No, at the door. So I said, Al, come on. I'll introduce you to the guys. And we're, they're all monsters. We're behemoths. <laughs> so he says to me, everybody is so sweaty. I said, yeah. He said, I don't think this is for me. And I said, Al, join. I'll get you a towel. <laughs> get him some water. Oh, oh my right. God. I'm, Dan Marie is now showing me a picture. 
Amazing. Amazing story, Hank. And, Kirk, um, you know, the Kirk movie I did with Kirk Douglas. Oh, my God. You know, oh, Charles Bronson as well. Yes. Wow. What a life. You got a great, you, you, you're still around, thank God, another hundred years left in you. And, um, you know, I mean, you're still working, Hank. Yes. Yes. And, and you get uh, the. Now concentrating on the release of the book. Uh, and uh, I'm going to be doing. They're putting some of the stuff into the Hollywood History Museum. Uh, Going to be the shoes, and uh, uh, it's just I, I am so flattered. I, I am so thrilled. Yeah, yeah you you're one of the great tank, and I know you do a lot for the wounded warriors as well. And um, you do so much stuff yes. for kids, and the, you go to jails and prisons, and you give. You talk to the kids about turning their lives around because, you know, honestly, Hank, most people would just say, you know what, I'm living over here in Beverly Hills. Screw everybody. You know what I mean? You're right. So, You're right. So you, You're absolutely right. Uh, but, and you have to give back. Right. And I believe so much in God. And God is, you know, just leading me in the right direction. He led me from, off the streets. And uh, I've got to give back. It's the way of life. Right. Amen. Amen, yeah, Hank. And uh, my audience yeah. out there listening, this is going to go world. We go on podcasts. We go on YouTube. This is going to be everywhere. And uh, for my audience out there, run out and get this book. It comes out on November 15th uh, from Harlem Hoodlum to Hollywood Heavyweight, The Life and Times of the Great Hank Garrett. And uh, one of the greats in the industry and uh, one of the nicest guys, too, as well. Because Lord knows I have had a couple of screwballs on, but um, Hank's one of the good guys. <laughs> <laughs> you might disagree with me, Hank. <laughs> oh, God. I was married to a couple of them. <laughs> <laughs> never, never, never. Hank, thank you so much from the bottom of my heart for doing this, for your time, and give my best to uh, Holland and um, your your wonderful manager as well. And uh, God bless and um Continue doing God what you're bless. doing because you do make it. You do make a difference, Hank. Believe it or not, you do make a difference in a lot of people's lives. Thank, thank you so much. All right, Hank. We will Stay. talk to you soon. And God bless and uh, be safe. Stop on. Stop on. Ciao. Ciao. Thank you so much, Hank. Ciao. Ciao. Ciao.